All right. Um, well, thank you guys again for joining us today for our um, happy hour webinar for our second um, iteration of our conservation concert conservation conversations. Um, this is a partnership between Miami Eco Adventures and the UF IFAS Miami Dade uh, Sea Grant. Um, these are two um, divisions within the eco unit of the Miami Dade County Parks, Recreation, and Open Spaces Department. Um, so today's topic is going to be uh, the conservation of sea turtles and their habitats in Miami Dade County. Um, so my name is Ed Pritchard. Uh, I am the uh, interpretive program lead of the Marine Conservation and Coastal Resilience Programs within the Eco Adventures Department. Um, and I'm based out of Cranon Park here in uh, Key Biscayne, Florida. So also on the line and who's gonna help me moderate today, I have Anna Zangronis, and a lot of you guys know her pretty well. Um, she's with the UF IFAS Extension uh, and Sea Grant. And then again, uh, we are all within the uh, Miami Dade County um, web there. And I also have my um, manager, Heather. Uh, she's also going to help out with, uh, both of them are going to help manage our chat. So throughout the presentation today, if you guys have any comments or um, questions that you have, please uh, utilize the chat. You can find that at the bottom of your Zoom screen. Um, and you can type that to, there's an option to type to the host or uh, all participants. Um, we recommend all the participants for the benefit of everyone. Um, so we're going to uh, go ahead and get started with an overview. Um, so we today we're going to be talking about the uh, history uh, of our sea turtle species, um, some species profiles of the ones that we find here in Miami Dade County, um, the threats to these species, uh, as well as some of the conservation efforts that we find here um, in in South Florida, and then what you can do to help. So we're going to go ahead and start off um, with a poll. Um, I'm going to go ahead and share that with you now. Um, this is just to, uh, we're going to cover all of these topics within our uh, presentation today. And then we're going to go ahead and take this afterwards. So take a few moments to answer this to the best of your abilities. And uh, we will go through them um, at the end. That poll is live there, Anna and Heather? Yes. Okay, perfect. Make sure that they, uh, you scroll down. There are five questions um, on this poll. So I'm going to give it another 30 seconds. So please get those responses in. Almost, almost there. Give it a couple more seconds. All right, so thank you for doing that. All right, so. So we'll start off. Um, so sea turtles are an ancient um, species. They uh, have been around for millions of years. Uh, the first time they showed up in the fossil record was about 245 million years ago. Um, one of those species uh, was the Archelon. Um, these guys predate the dinosaurs. Uh, so they showed up in the Triassic period. Um, this, uh, these species were fairly large, as you can see by that comparison. 
uh, 13 feet long, 16 feet wide from flipper to flipper, and weighed around 5,000 pounds. Um, so uh, very, very large. Now today we do not see them get about that big. Can, uh, I would like you guys to go ahead and comment in the chat, um, how many species of sea turtle do you think there are worldwide currently? How many, how many species can we find today? Sarah said seven, Amy said seven. Harrison said seven, Candy said seven. All right, well, they're all right. We've got some experts here. So seven is the correct number. We've got the green, the loggerhead, the leatherback, the Kemp's Ridley, the Olive Ridley, and the flatback and the hawksbill. So we have three species that we find here in South Florida in nesting in Miami-Dade County. Um, the nesting season officially is from May 1st to October 31st. Um, and we see uh, the loggerhead, the green, and the leatherback nesting on our beaches. So we're gonna talk about each one. Um, so of, uh, there are um, about 600 to 800 nests on average laid here in Miami-Dade County. 90% uh, of those are loggerhead nests. So they're the most common nester in Miami-Dade County. Um, when we talk about that nesting season, it's technically May to October, but we start to see them come up on the beaches a little earlier than that. Um, so we start to see the loggerheads, they, they're kind of staggered and when they come up. So loggerheads, we start to see them in April. Um, and uh, they're usually peaking in, in uh, late May and early June. Um, and then nesting through September. And then September is usually when we start to see uh, uh, the nest taper off and then our last few hatch outs. Um, the loggerhead weighs between 200 and 400 pounds. Um, as you can see, they're built, uh, they get their name from their large uh, skull and they have that distinct uh, almost like beak because they are feeding um, primarily on um, shellfish, crustaceans, uh, mollusks, um, so they're using that, that uh, beak to break into those, to that prey. And you can see some of the hatchlings down here, um, pretty cute. So next we have the green sea turtle. Um, they grow a little bit larger than the loggerhead. Um, they have that very pretty shell. Uh, they are, they grow about 300 to 500 pounds. Um, they are a uh, herbivore. So they are kind of the vegan of the sea turtle species. They prefer uh, submerged aquatic vegetation like seagrasses, algae, um, and here in Miami-Dade County we have extensive seagrass uh, beds, so it's a very important foraging um, habitat for them. Um, and they come up uh, usually from mid-May to September, um, so they're a little bit after the loggerheads start coming up. And again, they only make up about 5% of the nesting, so that's 5% of about 600 to 800 nests. Um, and again, we start to see them um, taper off into September. And then the third species, which is the largest species of sea turtle in the world, uh, is the leatherback. And as you can tell, they're a little bit different. They're built a little different than the hard-shelled uh, turtles. Uh, they have this unique uh, you know, leathery, obviously, with their name and like a rubbery uh, skin that wraps around them. And that's because of their, their lifestyle. Uh, they prefer their diet is strictly almost entirely jellyfish. And that's not just a small like moon jellyfish that you see washing up on the beaches, but um, some of these larger jellyfish that you might find in our, the Northern Atlantic, such as the, the lion's mane, um, those can grow you know, multiple feet. Um, and uh, they're diving pretty deep for that, that prey. So they're, they're built kind of like a whale, so they can dive pretty deep and they have that insulation to withstand both the cold temperatures and that increased pressure as you go farther, uh, farther down. Um, they can grow up to about 2,000 pounds, so they're like a small smart car um, when they're, you know, climbing up onto the beach. And we start to see them um, come up on the beaches a little earlier. We actually already have two, nut, two leatherback nests here in Miami-Dade County. Um, so they start late February, early March, and they're usually done in June. Um, and uh, again, they only make up about 2 to 3% of the 600 to 800 nests. So. Um, there, you see them nesting more up in uh, Palm Beach and Martin County are more important beaches for them here in Florida. So there's also two species that we do find offshore of uh, Miami-Dade County in South Florida. They don't nest here, they nest in other regions such as Central America and the Caribbean. 
these are the hawksbill and the Kemp's Ridley. Um, both of these species uh, are, uh, you know, again, found within our, our coastal waters. So we find them along our reefs, foraging along our reefs and in other areas offshore. So just a little bit about their life cycle so we can get an idea of how they're utilizing our habitats here. Um, so we'll start off. So the hatchlings, they emerge um, towards the you know, end of the nesting season. Um, we start to see them obviously with some of the nests. It takes about 45 to uh, 55 days on average for lo loggerheads and greens and closer to uh, 70 days for leatherbacks for those eggs to incubate. Then the hatchlings will hatch out and they'll uh, reach the ocean and they'll start this what's called a swimming frenzy. And so they're just racing out towards the, um, you know, the open ocean. Uh, there's an area called the Sargasso Sea. Um, that sargasm seaweed that you see washing up on our beaches in the summertime um, primarily, uh, there's large mats of those out in the, uh, past the Gulf Stream where they uh, find shelter and uh, that's where they're, they're feeding. And they spend their first couple of years there um, it's known as the lost years as uh, there's not been a lot of research and, um, you know, investigation into what their, you know, their life is like when they're out there. Um, but they'll reach maturity. Uh, well, they'll, they'll migrate back um, after several years out there and they've grown large enough and they'll start foraging um, again in these near shore waters. Um, and then they'll reach sexual maturity around 20 to 25 years. Um, and so that's when they are uh, returning to the beaches. The females um, return to the beaches that they were actually born upon. They're, it's ingrained within them when they first leave the nest. And so it's a pretty, pretty uh, cool thing about them. Um, but they'll, they'll mate offshore with males and then um, they will come up onto the beaches, lay their eggs. They can lay multiple nests in a season, depending on the species, um, you know, anywhere from 100 to 120 eggs. Um, and then they'll, you know, uh, complete that cycle and they'll do this, um, uh, you know, every, every couple of years is usually the pattern with each individual. So why do you think it's important that we conserve these species? Why, what is the goals behind our conservation effort? Um, if you want to kind of type in, uh, in the chat, uh, any comments or uh, reasons why you think it's important to conserve sea turtles. Do you have any comments? The circle of life, Marcia says. Yeah, yeah. I mean, they're definitely, um, when it comes to the circle of life, they're very integral. They're a keystone species for our oceans. They're an indicator species for our oceans. So they are important in the ecosystem and the food web. They're important when it comes to indicating the kind of the health of our ocean ecosystem. So yeah, as far as, um, you know, the circle of life is concerned, very important. What else? Candy said it's the indicator of health of the ocean and Harrison said to ensure species survival and maintain marine biodiversity. Yes, you guys hit on all the good points there. So yeah, so uh, uh, Candy, like I just said, yeah, the indicator species, they are um, the harbinger as far as, you know, how well our oceans are doing. And yes, Harrison, so as far as the populations are concerned, um, we want to make sure that these populations are around for you know another million years and and you know they're around for our kids and our grandkids to see so and protecting these populations because really they've faced a lot of threats and and their populations have declined significantly um since uh you know in the last uh, couple hundred years so they face quite a number of threats uh both man-made and or you know human induced and natural um so we'll go through a few of these and then we'll um excuse me, we'll uh, touch on a few of them in detail. So uh, first off, pollution, and that can come in many forms. So um, as you can see by the photos, uh, you know, a lot of you fami are familiar with marine debris and the impact it can have not just on sea turtles, but uh, all sorts of wildlife and even human health. Um, you know, that there's that video of, you know, sea turtle with a straw up its nose, but it's more than just, you know, straws. It's, it's plastic bags. It's, um, you know, smaller microplastics that end up in our ocean. Um, and so they can, it can really impact them at every stage of their life. Um, we can also talk about chemicals and, and in particular um, related to disease. If you look at the photo in the top left, this is of a, a juvenile green sea turtle 
the green sea turtles, again, they feed, you know, in near shore waters and in the seagrass beds, which are close to our, um, you know, uh, outputs and close to urban development. And so uh, the tumors that you see growing on its tissue, you can see some under the flippers and along the eyes. Uh, these are from a uh, virus that causes a disease called fibropapillomatosis, or FP for short. Um, and this has been linked to uh, poor water quality. Um, you know, fortunately, we have uh, rehab facilities that can remove these tumors, but they're really debilitating. Um, th again, that is linked to uh, chemicals and, and poor water quality. Um, we can also talk about fishing, um, both recreational and commercial fishing. Um, you know, in terms of recreational, uh, there's quite a bit of, you know, discarded fishing line hooks and other gear that can end up um, being detrimental to these species, uh, as well as commercial efforts. Uh, a lot of these use trawls and long lines and big nets, um, and there's a lot of bycatch involved with that, specifically sea turtles. Um, there are some different strategies that they've enacted, such as a, uh, there's a, a, something called a turtle excluder device on these bigger, um, you know, traps that allow the turtles to get out, but it's still an issue as far as bycatch, you know, uh, these turtles get caught up in these, in these uh, ghosts and and these active nets. Uh, poaching, um, this is a really big issue around the world. Um, you know, cultures have been, you know, taking these turtles for both their meat, their shells, um, include, and, and their eggs as part of their, you know, their normal diets. And, um, you know, the eggs, there's a apparent uh, aphrodisiac quality about them that some cultures, uh, you know, seek them for. And so they've, you know, there's a whole market for these eggs. And of course that's taking uh, that next generation of turtles out of the, out of the system. And, and so it can be very detrimental and, and there's, there's different uh, laws and, and uh, conservation efforts around the country um, trying to, you know, uh, curtail some of this legal poaching. Here in the United States, we don't see that quite as much. Uh, we'll talk about the Endangered Species Act and some of the laws that we have that prevent this from happening. Um, and then lastly on here, boat traffic. So especially here in Miami County, we have a lot of recreational boating and this can um, really harm our sea turtles, especially our turtles, they have to come to the surface to breathe. Um, they do not have gills, so they do come to the surface and that oftentimes is, you know, right in our near shore waters, especially in the summertime when they're here nesting, um, can lead to collisions and, and, and can really, the propellers can really tear them up and and sometimes lead to death. Um, so the boat traffic concerns um, are definitely prevalent here. It's actually the number one when it terms when it comes in to terms and with uh, strandings here in Miami County. So when we find uh, dead or injured turtles, boat traffic is usually the culprit. Now there's also natural threats to sea turtles, and that really is uh, comes in the form of predation. So we have a number of species that. Uh, predate upon sea turtles at all stages of their lives, uh, but, but specifically when they're hatchlings. So when they emerge, even before they emerge from the nests, um, they can be predated upon by crabs that can dig down and get eggs, uh, raccoons that can dig up nests. This is um, the species that we see a lot down here in South Florida. Um, and uh, when they emerge, we have the same predators and then also uh, birds, um, you know, you have uh, even feral cats sometimes. And then of course, when they hit the water, uh, they, you know, uh, there's a host of large fish and even, uh, you know, gulls and other seabirds that swoop down and get them. So they've definitely faced quite a, a journey to, you know, evade some of these predators before they can reach those sargasm beds and, you know, and, and grow to a, be a larger size. Um, and then when they're adults, we do see, sometimes see really the only predator to them would be sharks. So we do see shark predation on these turtles. Now, especially here in South Florida and along our coasts, uh, obviously these are important nesting habitats, but it's also a place for uh, coastal development. And with coastal development comes, you know, not just these large buildings that are right up alongside their habitat, but lead to a lot of other, um, you know, other threats that are uh, directed to that or related to that. Um, so that includes, um, you know, beach erosion. So obviously we change with all the infrastructure along our coastline with like seawalls and jetties and piers um, that can kind of change the, um, you know, the dynamics of the beach. And it can also shorten the amount of habitat that is available for nesting. Um, and it can lead to erosion. 
Um, also uh, beach furniture. So, you know, here in Miami Beach, we do see a lot of uh, hotels and condos, they have beach chairs out. Um, there are ordinances to, you know, have them move them up to the top of the beach during nesting season, but again, they can still become a, uh, a hazard. And then the topic that I want to talk about a little bit more is coastal lighting. So that's um, another big threat that comes along with development. So all of these threats obviously, um, you know, lead to these species. All seven species of sea turtles are endangered or threatened. So they're listed on that Endangered Species Act. And that's, again, these, these populations have been brought, brought to the brink of extinction over the last 200 years. And so that's really the, you know, uh, the conservation uh, initiatives that have been, effort has been started uh, because of this realization that these, you know, again, in the 50s, they, these populations might have seen endless as far as being able to take them, but really their populations need to be conserved. Um, and so that's where these conservation efforts um, started to come about. So we talk about light pollution. Um, so light pollution can have detrimental impacts, not just on sea turtles, but all sorts of different wildlife that depend upon, um, you know, uh, darkness really to, to survive. And it can have impacts on human health as well. Um, and so when we're talking about light pollution in terms of sea turtles, we're talking about those bright white um, you know, uh, bluish lights, which we find, if you look at the bottom here, the uh, visible light spectrum, uh, we, th this is, would be the, the short end of the spectrum, so over here, and that's the kind of lighting that we're talking about. Um, obviously, Miami-Dade County, we have quite a bit, you know, you look up at the sky, it's not just those direct point source lights, it's also just that sky glow. So what results of, when you look up at that sky, that glow that emanates from these big metropolitan metropolitan areas, like if you can tell by the satellite, you know Miami Dade and and just the uh, southeast Florida with Fort Lauderdale, Palm Beach, um, one of the brightest areas within the you know the southeast, and also this this region here is you know very critical nesting beach for those species. So it's um, it's a big issue. And so when we talk about the impacts that it does have on turtles, so turtles. Um, both the adults and the hatchlings are impacted by this issue. Um, when it comes to the nesting females, what they're looking for when they come up on the beaches in the summer is uh, a very dark beach. Uh, their instinct on a natural beach, they're looking for that, the, the dark, darkest spot um, in the most concealed area to both protect them while they're nesting and protect their hatchlings, um, you know, and provide them with, uh, you know, safety in the cover of darkness. So, you know, the light can really distract them um, and they can become disoriented by these lights that are shining all, all around the beach. Um, and, and in some cases, it, it causes them to turn around and go back to the water. And that expends a lot of energy for them to come up on the beach and then to not nest. We call that a false crawl when they don't end up nesting. And, and a lot of times this can lead to the turtles end up, you know, laying their eggs at sea, which is not optimal at all. Um, so it can really uh, distract and disorient the females. And then when it comes to the hatchlings, the hatchlings, when they emerge from the nest, their instinct tells them to go to the brightest horizon. Um, and in a uh, natural beach setting, this would be uh, the, night, the night sky, the stars, the moon reflecting off the ocean. But when you have, you know, an exorbitant amount of lighting on to the west of them, they're going to disorient in the wrong direction and that's towards danger. So think places like yards, streets, um, and sometimes pools. Uh, and it can also, you know, lead them to predators. Um, and again, just like the females, they can become dehydrated, exhausted, and they expend a lot of energy crawling around. Um, so obviously this, this can be a really big issue for, you know, those hatchlings um, as well as the females. Now, to address this issue, um, the, the re research has been found out that these turtles, they do not see uh, the other end of the spectrum very well. They're not as uh, susceptible to um, distractions from the, uh, the long end of the spectrum. So the red, the amber, the orange wavelengths, uh, they do not see as well. So, uh, when we talk about sea turtle friendly lighting um, and retrofitting some of these other lights that, that uh, impact them, we think of three things. Uh, we say keep it low, so that's low mounted to the ground. So 
basically it can be blocked out by a dune or it's just directed right at the surface on the ground where you know people need it for safety to walk around um, you know this is uh, in contrast to you know some of the lighting that we see that are problem lights are floodlights or spotlights just basically this light mounted on a post that shines up all over the beach um, keep it shielded is the another um, uh, another positive so this this would be as these pictures uh, show um, shielding that light so again it doesn't shine all around it shines directly where it needs to to be um, also motion sensors could also be another uh, a useful tool and then the, the last thing is keep it long so again keeping it on that long end of the spectrum so replacing bulbs with red or amber or um, you know these orange bulbs so um, how is this effort um, you know uh, being administered uh, so here in Florida uh, the Florida Fish and Wildlife Conservation Commission they are the um, agency that that um, manages sea turtles here in Florida uh, they put it into the Florida Administrative Code, a model lighting ordinance. So um, this was developed by them and it has all these guidelines for counties and municipalities to adopt as a lighting ordinance for sea turtle season. Um, so these, uh, again, for, with some of the techniques that we just described are in this, um, and of course it's different for each uh, beach, for each county, for each municipality. Um, but here in Miami County, we have lighting ordinances that, that have been adopted by um, each municipality that is bordering our beaches here. And again, they are enforced by uh, FWC lighting surveys. So they do surveys every year to identify sources of lights that could be an issue and also code enforcement. So the local, excuse me, the code enforcement with each municipality will go out and also identify problem lights and you know, uh, speak with business owners or property owners about these problem lights. Um, and, and again, residents can also be involved. If they see something like that, they can reach out to their uh, local code enforcement. So these, again, these aren't, um, this is not law. So as far as the Endangered Species Act is concerned, um, this is not a law on the books. Uh, this is just a lighting ordinance that is uh, recommended. And again, many, many municipalities and, and counties have adopted this here in Florida to protect our turtles. Um, so the good news, again, is that lighting issue is something that can be fixed. We can retrofit these lights. We can um, make these small changes, turn off our lights, uh, you know, shade, uh, shield them, things like that. And, and really the goal here is to, a lot of uh, in the past where there are beaches that were really bright, uh, sea turtle conservation folks would be, that are surveying, would be relocating nests to place these nests to places that are darker. Um, in order to give them a better chance. And of course, we want to decrease the amount of time, the amount of impacts that we're having or the amount of, um, you know, we want it to be as natural as possible. We don't want to have to relocate nests if we don't have to. So the goal there would be to retrofit and to enact this lighting in order to reduce the amount of times that we're relocating. So let's talk about um, some of the sea turtle conservation effort here in Miami-Dade County. So the work that's done uh, during our sea turtle uh, season for surveying is done by uh, staff with our department, the Miami-Dade County Parks, Rec, and Open Spaces Department. Um, and they're acting under a permit issued by the Florida Fish and Wildlife Conservation Commission. Um, and so any activities, any work with sea turtles um, is a permit. Uh, you have to have a permit to do so. Um, so the public cannot, um, it's illegal to harass or to handle or to do any sort of um, uh, impact to turtles uh, through, a, you have to do it through a permit. Um, these folks, uh, they cover 19 miles of beach uh, here in Miami-Dade County during the sea turtle season for surveying. Uh, this is all the way from the Broward County Miami-Dade line down to Key Biscayne. Um, this excludes areas like uh, Bill Bag State Park, uh, Biscayne National Park, and Virginia Key. Um, those are done by en other entities. Um, but again, they have about 600 to 800 nests per season. Um, and these nesting surveys happen officially May 1st to October 31st, but they are out there early. Um, they've already been out on our beaches every morning looking for, since April 15th, earlier this week, looking for any early nesters and marking those nests off. Again, they also respond to sea turtle strandings. So that means any sick, injured, um, you know, turtle that they come, uh, someone comes upon here in the county, uh, our staff would be out there looking for and, and responding to those instances. And I'll give you a number at the end of this PowerPoint to 
uh, to you know, write down so that you have that in case you uh, uh, happen to see a stranding. Uh, they also conduct outreach and education activities to engage with our citizens on, on sea turtle conservation. And they're collecting important scientific data, not just through their surveying, but um, other projects that they're uh, collecting data for, for uh, uh, different agencies. So real quickly, what would be, you know, they're nesting, what, what are they looking for when they're doing their surveys every morning? Um, so they're looking for this distinct track that's left behind by these turtles. So, um, you know, each turtle's track looks a little different, um, but, uh, and, and just to note that this photo is a turtle during the day. They usually, again, come up at night under the cover of darkness. Um, but this turtle, just so you could see the track better, um, it kind of looks like a little tractor that went up the beach. Um, they're looking for this. The turtle's up here um, digging its egg chamber. She'll lay anywhere from 100 to 120 eggs on average, and then she'll crawl back. So a successful nest would, you know, have that crawl over the mound, she'll camouflage it, and then she'll come back to the water. And then so what they're, they'll find that and they'll, you know, investigate and then uh, they'll mark it off with, and you guys have probably seen these on the beach, the stakes, the nesting tape, and the, the yellow signs that indicate that there is a nest there and tell people to, you know, stay away and that these are protected species. And then, of course, they're out there on the beach. They mark off those new nests, but they're also checking up on the nests that are, are, have already been laid. And so it takes about 45 to 55 days for the loggerheads and the greens to incubate in their eggs. Um, the, the sex of the eggs or the hatchlings are determined by the temperature of the nest. So we like to go with the mantra, hot chicks, cool dudes. So the hotter the sand is, the more females, and the cooler the sand, the more males. Um, and so the leatherbacks, their incubation time is closer to 60 to 70 days. But um, once those eggs hatch, once those hatchlings come out of their eggs, they'll kind of sit under the sand um, until they sense a drop in temperature. And that usually indicates that it's, you know, uh, nighttime. And so they'll emerge from the nest. That's their uh, intuition telling them to, to leave. And they'll work together. And what you'll see is this what we call a boil. So all these hatchlings are, you know, working together and, and popping out of the sand and, and then working their way to the water. Um, and again, it's a pretty cool sight to see. And so our surveyors are looking for that indication that you can see here, there's a little depression where the hatchlings came out and then the tracks leading down to the water. Um, and then they'll wait a few days and they'll dig up that nest and uh, record how many hatch, how many didn't to kind of get success ratios of the nest. And that helps with, um, you know, research on these species and, and things like that. And so these are what our hatchings look like, the loggerheads, the leatherbacks, and the greens. And again, this strategy, you know, they nest a few, they lay a few nests per season and there's, you know, 100 or 120 or so eggs per nest. But only one out of 1,000 hatchlings make it to the water and then to adulthood. So you can see that, you know, with all the threats that they face, we really want to do what we can with our conservation efforts to give every single one a fighting chance. So, you know, what can we do, you know, both, you know, here in Miami-Dade County as part of our conservation efforts, and then, you know, we'll talk about ways in which, you know, the public can help too, but um, we really want to protect their habitats. We want to protect the shorelines. Um, so that, that means correcting some of these lighting issues we described. Um, rethinking development. Um, how can we be more sustainable in our development and kind of live in harmony with these turtles and not uh, deplete, you know, some of their habitat that they can, uh, that they use, not just with nesting, but, you know, all of the other threats to their other, um, you know, habitat. Uh, also preserving, and that, that does have to do with preserving and restoring dune infrastructure. So keeping our dunes intact because those help reduce erosion and block out some of that light. Uh, education and outreach. Again, our turtle team does a great job providing, you know, uh, webinars and, and, and talks and opportunities to, um, to you know, uh, learn more about turtles. And again, working with uh, local state partners to uh, protect that ha critical habitat. So identifying, you know, the important habitat and doing what we can to create, um, you know, uh, protections for them. And then addressing the marine debris issues, and that can be through, um, you know, uh, plastic bag bans or um, just, you know, again, promoting uh, less waste and, um, you know, reduce, reuse, recycle. Um, and then factoring in sea level rise projections is important too, because, you know, we're encroaching on their habitat, you know, from the west, but, you know, we have r rising seas related to 
uh, climate change and that's shrinking that habitat even more. So factoring that into our, our conservation efforts as well. So how can you make a difference individually for these, for these guys? Um, you know, again, we talked about, you know, keeping our beaches clean, our waterways clean, addressing that marine debris issue in our daily lives. Um, recycling, that could be through recycling, re, uh, using reusable bags. Um, we don't want to disturb nesting mothers, their eggs, uh, nests, or hatchlings. Um, again, it's, it's illegal to harm or uh, tamper with a nest. Again, there's, there's uh, good enforcement of this and there's uh, uh, fines and even jail time associated with uh, harassment. So um, again, we don't see a lot of that, but keep that in mind. Uh, we want to refrain from walking on the beach after dark during nesting season. We want to keep our beaches empty for these turtles. Um, knocking down sand castles, filling in holes, that's decreasing those hazards to them, both the mothers and the hatchlings, and removing that, those hazards like beach furniture as well. And then of course, you know, from a lighting standpoint, uh, we can write to our officials for sea turtle safe lighting. Um, again, check in, you can look at the FWC, uh, their website, they have a whole website uh, related to sea turtle safe lighting. And you can look at your local ordinances and you can get information about who to contact as far as code enforcement to report any sort of lighting issues along your beach. Um, and then again, even if you're not living along the coastline, keeping your curtains shut, turning off those lights that contribute to that overall sky glow can really uh, make a difference. Um, if you're boating recreationally, uh, stay alert, um, abide by uh, channel markers and speed uh, limits, um, and just uh, give yourself a better, you know, more reaction time when it comes to, um, you know, sea turtles. Uh, supporting our conservation organizations is vital any way you can, um, whether that's, you know, attending uh, a, a lecture or um, contributing to them. Um, a lot of organizations around the state are nonprofit. Uh, so, so looking into the ones that are in your area and seeing how you can help out. And then you can always help by raising awareness. So educating your friends, your family, talking about sea turtles and how, how they can ind help individually as well. So here's that number I was talking, or the two numbers that I was talking about as far as how to report a stranding, a uh, dead or sick, injured or lethargic turtle or any other sea turtle emergency. The 305 number is here in Miami County. That's for our Miami County Sea Turtle Conservation Team. And then the FWC Wildlife Alert Hotline. Um, they answer at all hours. Again, the 305 number, that's a hotline for us. But um, if you can't reach anyone there, the FWC number, they will get in contact with um, somebody that can come out and um, you know address the situation and, and or give you uh, guidance on what to do next. But please don't take it into your own hands. Call the authorities. So with that, um, again, thank you guys. Um, I'm gonna have you guys take our webinar poll again to see how much uh, you guys learned. Um, let me start that. So take a few moments and answer that. Yeah, and it's launched. Oh, perfect. Um, so while you guys are working on that, I just wanna mention that we will also go ahead and send or um, Heather, Anna, if you want to put the link to the exit survey um, in the chat box, um, we have an exit survey that's going to help us as far as, um, you know, you can provide any sort of comments or, um, you know, what uh, feedback that you have. Um, and also, we'd like to hear from you if you have any suggestions for future content that you want to see for these webinars. Uh, we will be hosting these for the foreseeable future um, until, you know, until we can be with you live um, and in person. And so we want to you know, know what you guys want to want to see. Uh, next week, we will have uh, uh, our topic will be marine debris. And that will be presented by um, one of my eco adventures colleagues, uh, Crystal. Um, so tune in for that. And we'll provide our links for that. Um, on the next slide, I'll show you we have our social media pages. Um, so we, uh, we encourage you guys to continue to tune in 